Will the fourth time be the charm for the Republican-controlled redistricting commission? Joining us on Columbus on the Record this week, Anna Staver, State House reporter for the Columbus Dispatch, Mike Miller, Republican strategist, and Sam Gresham, Democratic strategist. Republicans who control the Ohio Redistricting Commission this week ignored the work of professional map makers hired to redraw state and Senate and House districts, choosing just to tweak the last rejected map instead. All this while the future of Ohio's primary floats in limbo. Sam, you've said that the commission is both undermining the will of the Ohio voters while marginalizing communities of color. Is this still the case? Yes, it is, and it's, it's clearer than ever before. Four, now we have to have four times. We've had three. In baseball games, if you had three, you struck out. I want the, the court to institute some form of contempt. I don't think you're going to get them to do anything until they have to pay a price, whether it's an individual price, a collective price, some sort of force has to be used now. Mike, in the state constitution, it says that the courts cannot implement a map that hasn't been voted on by the commission. What power should the court have at this point? Well, it depends who you talk to, uh, Andy. Uh, you know, some want the court to draw the uh, districts themselves, others do not. All this is up in the air. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen, whether the federal uh, system gets involved or not. Uh, and they may well when it comes to some of the congressional maps. I just don't know. Uh, this is breaking politically with the exception of uh, the Chief Justice. Democrats vote solid one way, the Republicans vote solid the other way. I, a few months or a few weeks ago in this program, uh, I indicated that I thought this might be a problem and uh, I had no idea it was gonna be this much of a problem. But, you know, this, this is not really a, a, a stunning surprise was reading the other day where the Supreme Court, the U.S. Supreme Court or something, refused to take a case from Pennsylvania, I think it was Pennsylvania, whereas the other one, you know, the Democrats. And, and we all know whoever is in control, I don't care who they are, are going to try and do things to benefit their party, period. And it's been that way my entire life. It'll be that way 30 years from now. So what they do, I don't know. you got two different uh, political parties, one wants one thing and one wants the other, and both of them point the fingers and say, it's all your fault. Mike, so, I'm, Mike, I'm gonna come back to you. This is a process that was voted on by the voters in 2015. It's the first time we've ever seen it in play. The Republicans on the commission, uh, excluding Auditor Keith Faber the past two times, have voted for maps that have been found unconstitutional. The court sends it back. Are Republicans on the commission playing by those rules? Well, I don't know. I'm not on the commission. I like to give everybody the benefit of the doubt, but uh, you can say that if you wish. Uh, that to me is uh, this, this idea of everybody's trying to do something terrible. I would disagree with Sam about let's hold everybody in contempt. And uh, to me, this it's it's a problem. And eventually in, in the not too distant future, it'll get satisfied. But why we want to draw blood and all this, I, I don't know. You, know, you say it's unconstitutional. You know, there's three of the four people on the Supreme Court that said it's fine. So this is certainly not black and white by any means. Anna Staver, while all this is going on, we have an Ohio primary to think about. What does all this mean for the future of Ohio's May 3rd primary? Well, it means a little bit of chaos, just like the process. Um, the uh, Secretary of State just came out and said, like, if you guys don't do anything by the end of today, we're going to have a bifurcated primary. And what that means is essentially statewide candidates, congressional districts on the May 3rd, and then the state house and Senate maps probably at some later date, maybe even as late as August. Sam, we're going back and forth, the court to the commission, to the court to the commission. It can get confusing. What kind of effect do you think this has on voters? It has showed the voters that, that what they say does not matter. Over 70% of the voters in Ohio, twice, the 15, uh, 2015, 2018, voted more than 70%. And in the last election, all 88 counties passed this. I think it's a total disregard for what the voters say. I think it's a total disregard for uh, the law. 
Now, I understood what Mike said. Yes, Democrats would be doing the same thing. And as an independent, I would say they are wrong. They need to follow the law. The one thing that we were criticized for, and when we passed those two initiatives, was it should have been an independent commission. Fine, but we thought we could get them to work by following the law. Obviously, that didn't happen. And the other thing we didn't have at the time of negotiation is Obama and Holder out there who filed the suit against everybody to make them move forward with the maps. So it's a dynamics are different. Now, one more thing I'll ask. The people we negotiated with in 15 and 18 are not in control of the General Assembly now. Yeah, and just a few seconds left. So what we saw at the beginning of this process, this fourth time around, is independent map makers were brought in. We saw a live stream. Then sort of at the last minute, there was a change of heart. Why did Republicans go with a different strategy at the end? Well, Senate President Matt Huffman talked about having concerns with the ability of the map makers to get done on time. And then they had concerns about compactness and division of communities. That's their argument in the maps that were drawn by the independent map makers. Now, if you talk to Democrats, they don't believe a word coming out of Matt Huffman's mouth. So I don't know. We'll have to kind of wait and see what the court has to say. Mike, like you said, we're seeing this in other states, some of them democratically controlled, also going to court. Here it's Republican controlled. What does this mean for accountability on both sides of the aisle when it comes to just elected officials not being able to create maps? Uh, honestly, the law, right, I don't think it'll have much difference at all. I don't think uh, the pop population of this state or any other state really has a great deal of faith in politicians, be whatever stripe they are. Democrat, Republican, conservative, liberal, and uh, sometimes they look at this and think they have good reason to feel that way. All right. Well, when Democratic gubernatorial candidates debated on Tuesday, it was clear that they had a public enemy, number one, between them, Republican incumbent Mike DeWine. You know, Mike DeWine and so many Republicans, they like to act like they're on the side of law enforcement. Well, law enforcement said this will get cops killed. This will get firefighters killed. Mike DeWine has basically said it's open season on a cops. I know better than you how to keep communities safe. When Ann and I have both had to deal with mass shootings, it's awful. You comfort the families next time. And Governor Mike DeWine took to the stage to speak. The people in Dayton shouted in frustration, do something. And Governor DeWine said that he would indeed do something to deal with common sense, to deal with gun violence and create gun, gun safety rules. Never in my worst nightmare did I think that the thing he was going to do was to actually make it worse. Mike Miller, this is probably as good of an explanation as any for why Governor DeWine decided against the Republican gubernatorial debate. Well, Annie, you know, these are open season on policemen and all this sort of thing. This is just political nonsense. I happen to agree that uh, the guns legislation has been passed by the Republicans is bad. I don't like it. I've never liked it. I don't even like concealed carry, period, much less concealed carry without any training. I think it's absurd. But you got to look around the country. They're acting like 95 percent of the country think that way. They don't. Probably a majority of the people interpret the Second Amendment so broadly that this is a normal thing and should always have been there. I don't see it that way. Uh, I think it's a mistake to have these uh, liberal gun laws in Ohio. But on the other hand, uh, you know, I, I'm not a dictator. I don't get to rule these things. People think different ways. I'm sure that Governor DeWine, I think anybody could say, it, if he knew, if we all knew and none of us do, that this is gonna lead to a thousand more homicides a year, a thousand more killings, he wouldn't sign it. I don't think the Republicans, I hope, wouldn't pass. But uh, we all know what the Second Amendment and, and the way feelings are one side or the other, very similar to abortion, to the death penalty. I mean, there is, these things are gonna be there for a long time. Uh, to me, it was just the, uh, you know, DeWine's a terrible man and does all this thing. And I just ignore that. It isn't, they don't talk like he's, He's really a fine man, but I disagree with that. But I listen to him. 
It doesn't go that way. Just everything he does is bad, you know, and to me, I think we're better off than that, although I don't see much debates that are reasonably held. Sam Gresham, do you see it that way? And do you think that this is a strategy that can help a Democratic candidate win? No, I don't. And I agree with Mike. Governor DeWine is a decent human being. Now, philosophically and policy-wise, I disagree with him on things. And I think the Democratic candidates are going at the wrong approach. Targeting him is not the approach in my mind, because his own party tried to silence him on the gun bill, on COVID, on House Bill 6. If I was a strategist for the Democratic candidate, it would be the most recently passed concealed carry law, and then it would be the COVID treatment of the governor and governmental institutions during the COVID period, and then I would go for House Bill 6. Scandal, 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 scandal. I listened to the debate. They touched on it, but they didn't really focus on these things that I'm talking about. The scandal, I mean, come on now. How could you not do that as a part of your campaign? Anna Staver, this was one of the big spotlights for both uh, Democratic candidates. What other uh, topics did they hit during the debate, and does it seem like it's gaining traction among voters? Um, Well, one of the topics where there is actually the most tension, I think there was a lot of camaraderie and agreement on a common enemy, but they actually split a little on abortion. Um, If you look at John Cranley, he used to be more, to have more of a pro-life position, but he changed in recent years. And then kind of called him out for it a little bit saying, you know, if you're a Democrat and this is a year where Roe v. Wade may be overturned, do we want somebody who's been a little wishy-washy on this issue? Now, he says that in talking with his wife about their family planning decisions, he came to see, quote, the error of his ways on this issue. But it was kind of interesting to see like a little bit of where they might differ uh, policy-wise. So, Mike, uh, Governor DeWine did not agree to a debate. He is being challenged by several Republican candidates, challenging him on, on the far right. Do you think DeWine is still the front runner in that race? Oh, absolutely. I don't think there's any doubt about it. I think he'll run uh, easily in the Republican primary. And do you? Th- what do you think about his chances in the general election then? Well, I don't know. I mean, you look all this, we got all these numbers going through redistricting, it seems to be. But the last 10 years it's been, I think this is right, uh, something like 54 to 46 statewide Republican. Uh, I don't think it's gonna change much. I may be wrong for the reasons that Sam points out. I agree, those are the Republicans' weak points, the uh, thing with householder and so on. But uh, I don't think it's gonna change one way or the other a, a great deal, many minds. Okay. Well, going from the gubernatorial debate to the Republican U.S. Senate debate, where most of the seven candidates repeatedly touted their affinity for former President Donald Trump, who has yet to endorse in this race. When asked about the endorsement of Georgia Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, who was at a noted who was a noted speaker at a recent white nationalist event and who called the president of Ukraine a thug, Senate candidate J.D. Vance did a quick pivot to his support for the former president. Marjorie endorsed me. Uh, she's a friend of mine. She's a patriot. And I also think it's funny because all these guys, their negative attack ads against me say that I say I don't like Donald Trump. And of course, I did say some negative things about Donald Trump six years ago. Uh, but if I was anti-Trump, then his strongest advocate in Congress would not be behind me. And I'm proud to have her support. Anna Staver, columnist Jason Williams of the Cincinnati Inquirer wrote recently that a Trump endorsement can't come soon enough for Ohio voters. Uh, paying attention to the primary race, saying that an endorsement would, as he put it, hopefully trigger a candidate or two to drop out of the race. How focused are Republican primary voters on the race with so many candidates? Yeah, there are seven candidates total, if you're counting, which is a lot of people to keep track of. Um, Some, like Mr. Vance and Josh Mandel, are polling higher than others. I think this was the first time that we saw Mike Kukita on, like, the debate stage, for example, with everyone else. But... 
You know, I think no one has had a clear, like solid lead in any of the polling that I've seen. And there's still a large number of undecided voters, even in some of the more recent um, checks. And I just, I wonder if they're waiting to see if Trump makes an endorsement in this race. I know, you know, we hear that Gibbons has been down to see him, Mandela has been down to see him, Timken is gone, Vance has like, you know, been courting his, his uh, one of his sons. Uh, I think it could really clear the field to a certain extent, um, but with it, we're looking at now one month to go. Um, early voting starts on Tuesday. If he's going to make a move, he probably has to do it soon. Mike Miller, do you think he's going to make that move? Well, I think I agree with what uh, Matt Dolan. Again, I didn't watch the, uh, the debate, but what I read about it, Matt Dolan had, I thought, the best line going when he said the other six people there are trying to get the uh, vote of one man who doesn't live in this state and doesn't vote here. <laughs> I think that's true. But you know, you go back to the uh, last election, November of uh, 2020. My wife and I do a lot of driving around with COVID. You know, please just get the heck out of the house. And uh, you know, whatever city we're in, like Columbus, you saw nothing but Biden signs, nothing. You go out in the country and you see nothing but Trump signs. Again, that's the dichotomy of how people feel. These people, are the, they're trying to win an election and they look, well, Trump won Ohio by what, 8%? So regardless of what we may think, I want his vote because I want to be, I want to win the election. You know, again, I think it's, uh, it's too bad. Uh, you know, these other things when we're talking about the guns and abortion, you know, I can remember way, Sam will remember this, Ann is too young, but at the last minute when Tony Celebrates, who was a very good friend of mine, uh, running for governor against Winovich, suddenly switched and became, you know, on the abortion issue. And uh, more recently, I can remember Ted Strickland getting down to the thing on the gun, the Second Amendment, and became a pro-gun, you know, and uh, that's just politics. People are not going to, I don't think, very few people are going to stick to really what they believe. And I, I look at Congress and there's not many Joe Manchins around or Liz Cheney's who are going to do what they think is right. Even if you disagree with it, they will do what they think is right. They don't follow the Republican line. They don't follow the Democrat line. They do what they believe is right. And I don't see many of those people around. Sam, as, as mentioned before, most of the candidates fighting for that Trump endorsement. This is a state where former President Donald Trump won by eight percentage points both times. Uh, is it a clear uh, path to success if they establish themselves as Trump candidates? I don't think so. And I always want to remind people this. Uh, our current Democratic senator only won by 7% in his last election. So he and Trump are close. Yeah. There is no guarantee. I think Trump's value is waning. And I think as the 2002 election move forward, its value would diminish. And particularly when we get to 2024, I think it would have diminished a great deal. In fact, I'll predict the day he will not run for president of the United States. And if he does run in a primary, he will lose. Now, see, that's going against the trends of the Republican Party. Um, I think his value is overblown. I think people see too much in it that's not there. I want you to be reminded that of the endorsements with few exceptions that people that Trump endorsed, they lost yeah. by and large, except for that guy in Virginia. Uh, the majority of his candidates have lost. So I don't see the value in it. Now people are gonna say you are liberal, you're a Democrat and all of that. I'm trying to have an honest, assessment of his political value. And I will also say one more thing. By the time we get to 2024, he's going to be indicted. And indicted people cannot run for election. Okay, so I'm so not worried about it. Real quick, before we move on, I want to get Anna Staver in here. Anna, this has been a long campaign. Some of these candidates have been campaigning for a long time. Do any of them seem to be standing out, seem to be getting any traction among voters? Um, the only one that's really seen a rise in recent weeks has been uh, Mike Gibbons. He kind of went from low in the polls to high, and I attribute to that too. I don't know about you guys, but anytime I turn on my television, I see an ad for him. And I think all those ads really paid off, because for a while, I think he was the only candidate up 
and he really got his name out there. All right, moving on to our last topic, the Ohio Supreme Court in January upheld a lower court ruling that reduced bail for a Hamilton County man charged in a 2020 shooting death. Tough on crime Republicans have responded with a proposed constitutional amendment to make it easier to keep people behind bars until trial or plea deals. They say the goal is to make Ohio safe. Sam Gresham, the chief proponents, Ohio Attorney General Dave Yost and Hamilton County Prosecutor Joe Dieters told the Columbus Dispatch that it's a myth that innocent people are sitting in jail awaiting their day in court. Now, Ohio Public Defender Tim Young said, instead, safety concerns should be addressed by imposing non-financial conditions, such as travel restrictions. So what do you think, Sam? I happen to see the other side of that coin. There are people I know personally who are in jail not in uh, and or in prison because they can't afford the, the bail. Now, you have to be judicious on this. You can't let crazy people out. You just can't let anybody out. But the bail should not be, a financial bail should not be the only thing that you have as a stick on these people. There are, there are, there are lots of people out there just don't have the money uh, to pay for it. And when they get to court, they're innocent. If they get to court, a lot of them get injured or hurt in prison. Mike Miller, former Franklin County prosecutor, what do you think about this latest discussion on, on criminal justice reform and bail reform? Well, I don't think a great deal of it. Uh, my experience is, you know, 50 years now, uh, this is low in the total poll. I, when I was in the prosecutor's office, as prosecutor for 17 years, you know, I knew most of the defense attorneys, we got along and so forth. I do not remember one single time where anybody came to me and said, Mike, this kid's in jail, he can't make bond, can't we go along with something less? Because he knew if I said yes, the judge would go along with it if both sides agreed. I don't remember anybody coming to me. Now, maybe that's not a good example, but what Sam says I think is so important People who are charged with nonviolent offenses and, and have no record, I don't care if you make it a law that they must receive a recognizance bond and not have to put up 10 cents. You know, I, I can accept that. These violent people that go out and commit rapes and murders and have long backgrounds, to me, it's an absolute joke to say, well, protecting the public should not be a part of bail. You know, just let them out. Now, let, let the first guy go out and kill somebody and you're going to see everything flip to the other side. How could you possibly do something? How could you judge let somebody out? It, it's ridiculous. But there is a way in Ohio now, and it's been there for some way, some time, where you can just give no, give a person no bond. It's a bit complicated. People have to appear and testify and so forth. But I think it's 2937.222 on the so, Ohio Revised Code. My, so we may be arguing about nothing, but... I think public safety should be number one. So Mike, let me ask you this then, if it comes down between a legislative change, a constitutional change, or is this something that should be up to the discretion of prosecutors, defendants, uh, and judges? Well, it certainly should be up to prosecutors. It ought to be up to judges. Uh, and as I say, I, I understand that undoubtedly there are people in this state that are held on uh, charges that aren't very serious and are held because they can't get out on bond because they don't have any money. I'd be a fool if I said that didn't happen. And in order to, uh, I assume the judges are setting bond in good faith, but they could be wrong. But I, I'm not opposed to letting all those people out, 100% of them, it, uh, awaiting trial. As long as it's nonviolent, they don't have any past record, you know, I, I think that's fine. And that'll take care of these problems that uh, Sam points out, people couldn't get out because they didn't have money. But when you get into violent offenses, I think that's, that's another matter. Anna Staver, for years now, we've seen the legislature, Republicans and Democrats, moving towards more criminal justice reform, moving towards bail reform. So does, does this latest action from Attorney General Dave Yost, from county prosecutors, does that go in the opposite direction than what we've seen from the legislature? A little bit because we've seen groups, even conservative groups like the Buckeye Institute, AFP Ohio, these traditionally Republican institutions come out in favor of 
uh, bail reform. And actually, the Buckeye Institute came out in opposition to what uh, Dave Yost is proposing. And they're sort of saying that there is a multitude of tools that judges have. Um, they can use ankle monitoring and other kinds of like restrictions on who you can talk to, certain types of check regular check-ins, and things that you can do to monitor people on bail and ensure that they are not acting inappropriately. But it is a larger, more complicated conversation. And I agree, especially when it comes to somebody accused of a violent crime. Yeah, it's a larger, complicated uh, discussion and a discussion we're probably going to continue having for a while now. It's time to move on to our final off the record parting shots. Sam Gresham, you first. I hope we find some way to move forward on this court case that I'm involved with. It is uh, the precipice of this country is on a French franchise to vote. We have to find some way to draw lines that are equitable. Okay, Mike Miller. Well, this isn't uh, political, but I think that uh, in a few days, Major League Baseball opens, and to me, it's, it's almost a, every year about this time, it's like a rebirth. And I have great hopes that my team will win, although I know they won't. Uh, and I just wish politics were that same, at least every spring, we can start fresh. Anna Staver. I have a little PSA for folks. If you are not registered to vote, Monday is the deadline for the May primary, and early voting is supposed to open on Tuesday. So no matter what's going to be on our ballots, um, I absolutely believe that like decisions are made by the people who show up. So you should absolutely go vote in your primaries and get registered. All right. Habits. All right, and my final comment is that we are in limbo and we don't know what's going to happen with the redistricting and with the primaries. That's it for Columbus on the Record for this week. Please check us out online. We're on Facebook. You can connect at our website, wsu.org slash COTR, and you can watch the shows there. I'm Andy Chow. Have a good week.